I was a graduate student. Uh, my background is I was a graduate student at Berkeley and studied demography, uh, and then uh, I was away in the wilderness for several decades and returned here uh, 10 years ago uh, in 2013. Uh, and the connection to my student years, I hope I will make a little bit later uh, when I talk about uh, Leo Goodman. Uh, so thanks to Audrey and her students who were I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't say this talk has been tested out and improved, who, who were the first victims of this talk. Uh, um, uh, Maria Osborne actually is here and she, because uh, I had done these calculations very quickly and I wasn't sure they were right. And uh, so she has kind of replicated them. So I'm actually not presenting her results. I'm still representing my results, but she can correct me if things changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she's gonna help, I think, move forward a little bit. Uh, so Guy Steklov is my co-author on several talks on names. He's actually not involved in this project, but he's the inspiration for it. And uh, to my teachers, uh, this talk, which I apologize, is not a serious, a serious and scientific talk, but it is it's not much inspired by uh, the many teachers I've had. Uh, I'll start maybe I'll do it in chronological order. Uh, so Hervé Lebrasse in France uh, loved to draw maps love to talk about uh, the importance of place in terms of demographic and political behavior. His uh, book, I think, uh, The Three Francis is, 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 is a classic. Uh, then when I was applying to graduate school, I had a lot of interaction with Susan Watkins at Penn um, and almost ended up going to Penn uh, because I had such fun conversations with, with, with Susan. But I unfortunately I visited Penn in like the first of April and I visited Berkeley on the first of April. And well, okay. Uh, and, and, and Susan, her, her, her work on the European Fertility Project and uh, probably to nations, of course, lots of spatial uh, demography there. And then uh, at Berkeley, uh, uh, John Wilmoth and, 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 and Ron Lee both did these kind of uh, log multiplicative models, which we'll see. Uh, and Ken uh, uh, definitely, you know, the, the long arm of history uh, here. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, Leo Goodman, whose model I'll be applying here, uh, was, uh, you know, it's not the inspiration for this talk, but the, the one thing that I learned from him, I'm applying in this talk. So, uh, certainly not, it's not, uh, it would be uh, not worthy of him to honor him with this talk, but it's nonetheless, I'm inspired by my time with him. Okay, so uh, today uh, we'll be looking at uh, trying to measure culture with naming patterns and uh, measuring whether the cultural divides uh, in the United States and how those line up with uh, American elections, presidential elections. And this is not a rigorous study across uh, all years with a lot of statistical analysis. It's rather just trying, how do we, how do we even, the basic point of the talk will be, how can we describe the geography of baby names using uh, Leo Goodman's statistical model, and how does that line up with uh, with, with elections? Uh, and since there have been different electoral patterns in the United States, has the pattern of naming kind of tracked the the, the, the electoral pattern? Okay, uh, is it the economy? Stupid? Is that that's the is that's the, I think the Clinton line? Um, uh, is the economy stupid, or is it really culture? So a great way to give a talk is you just, if you want quotes, you just type the thing you want quotes about into Google and then it gives you a bunch of people who said that. So Trump is about college, culture, not economics is what I typed and lo and behold, I got all parts of the, uh, what, do you, what do you even call this? Vox, National Review, Brookings and Atlantic, those all have something in common. The, the mainstream uh, uh, non-extreme media. Uh, uh, and you remember, all this argument, I'm sure. I, I'm sure. Uh, don't know if we heard it so much in 2020. That would be an interesting thing to talk about. Okay. Um, and so, uh, the story that I'll be telling is that uh, indeed the geographic realignment of politics uh, goes uh, hand in hand with the geographic alignment of culture and identity. And I use the word hand in hand, that's shorthand for, I'm not saying causes, <laughs> uh, and I'm not even gonna use the word associated because Leo gets his, his uh, uh, model of association here. So hand in hand just means we're not gonna talk about causality particularly, but they go together. Um, and then uh, how am I gonna measure cultural identity? Well, uh, we're gonna do that 
by looking at the names that parents give their babies. Uh, and there's going to be, I guess, a simple way to think of this. They're going to be red names and they're going to be blue names. Or are, we're asking the question, are there red names or blue names kind of thing? Uh, OK. So let's think about the theory here. What is in a name? Uh, and you could have uh, either that names mean something, which would be reasonable, that certain names mean something and they have a, a fixed social meaning and named after a person or something. Or you could kind of be a more structuralist thinker, you know, quoting Saussure and things and saying that the signifier is arbitrary and names don't mean anything. Uh, and I think both of those things are true. Some names are just take on a meaning and others have a name, name, name meaning because of a particular association. But either way, uh, I, the argument is there'll be good measures of culture. So let's think about that names have no fixed meaning that they're just some neutral thing that just diffuses in a population and that uh, you know the name Dennis doesn't have any connotation and the name Josh doesn't have any connotation other than the people who are named that who just get randomly seated. Well, then the people who have the same names are going to be somehow socially connected because that's the process by which the names are, are, are spreading. So if it's social contagion, the names will tell us about uh, uh, who's connected, you know, in some sense, culturally, I'm using the word very loosely. Uh, if Anne were here, she could probably tell me which sense I'm using it in. Um, uh, so, and, and in fact, I'm not going to show, I, I think I have a, a problem with this talk is I'm not going to show you the different names at different times. I'm just going to show you the most recent ones. Uh, but we'll see that different names are associated with different things over time. And it, it's kind of a, a, a random thing. Okay, but then there's also names with meaning. Uh, so you could think of names showing, uh, you know, religiosity, uh, uh, particular cultural affiliation. Uh, you could name somebody after a specific person, and that could be a, your model, or not name them after a specific person because that person's not your model. Um, and so, I, you know, either way, uh, what, what the argument here is that there's something in the air, and there's something in the there's different airs in different places. So the air in Texas is different from the air in Minnesota. The social the social cultural air, and that parents are, even though they're making an individual choice, uh, they're giving a name that seems right, and that it's a product of their, the, the cultural moment, the, the zeitgeist, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the culture of that moment in that place. Do people agree with this? I don't know. Is it obvious? Is it so? Is it, is it impossible to disagree with, or is it controversial? This is Lieberson in his book on names makes the case that that's it's an ideal thing to look at for culture, precisely because yes, you don't need money to name it somebody something. It's purely taste. That's right. I would like to have a Mercedes, but limited means. But I can kid, call my kid Mercedes. Exactly. Good. Yeah, and Stan Lieberson is. You know, there are many sociologists who are done a lot of important work, but at Berkeley, Stan Lieberson. Um, okay, so I'm never gonna start with an apology, but and I think we don't have a bunch of political scientists here because this was announced at the last minute, but I am not an expert on elections or on measuring cultural patterns of voting or anything like that. And I'm sure there in this building are people who know much more about this than I do. Uh, you know, my aim was just, to, okay, I can do this. This will be fun. Uh, it'll be approachable. It'll be a good way to start the series. There's not a lot of demography in it. There's a little bit of statistical rigor using uh, using Leo's model, but uh, you know, this will be a little bit different talk than, <laughs> than probably we'll see the rest of the semester. Uh, and then I do have an apology for boys. We just had our, our, our meeting for first year graduate students uh, where one of our discussions was uh, Susan Watkins' paper, what would we know about women if all we did was read the journal Demography, quoting the title, and, uh, and I'm guilty of this. I'm doing boys because when I looked at the boys' names, I just kind of, they, they seem to resonate more with culture to me than looking at the girls' names. So maybe that's because I'm a boy. Maybe that's because there's more variation in, in, in boys' names. Uh, I'll show you at the end that the, you can do the statistical analysis with the girls' names. It ends up the same way. Uh, we can then you can ask yourself when you look at the names, do they, they, they have a stronger or weaker connotations than the boys? So I do apologize for doing 
uh, boys here. Okay. Boys would be the, the baby boy who was got the name, the boy's name. Okay, so uh, you could use other approaches. We, we have Claude here, who, who's probably an expert in other approaches. Uh, the diversity of things what one could do. You could look at the geography of people answering questions in surveys, like, like the general social survey, that would be great. Uh, and I'm sure you could build up a composite index that would predict uh, these electoral maps very, very well. People's attitudes on all kinds of things. Um, you could probably get wonderful uh, media data about you know who watches Yellowstone, uh, who watches Seinfeld. I don't know. I'm just making this up, but it probably maps very well to the kinds of things that we're going to find here. Um, the the reason we're using names is because I, first of all, that's kind of where I started. I thought because I've been working on names, I got this idea. But I think a good a good kind of uh, a good rationale for using is we have this long historical time series. We don't have a Nielsen ratings going back to the early 20th century. Um, you know, there might be wonderful things that you could do with Sears, you know, Sears and Roebuck. You could look at who ordered what in Sears and Roebuck <laughs> until 1965, and then you'd have to have a kind of a dead period, and then you could look at who orders what from Amazon. I mean, there would be complicated ways to build a time series, but we have this long historical time series. The Social Security Administration, so what they do is they just tabulate the top names on people applying for Social Security cards by year of birth. So uh, in recent decades, uh, you don't get a tax advantage, I think, without a social security number. So everybody gets a social security number in the, hosp in, in the hospital. Uh, people who got their social security cards as adults, it's then mapped back to the year of their birth. So for modern decades, we're getting the babies' names. Uh, kind of, and for previous decades, we're getting the people's names as reported when they're older, but usually that's the baby name. Uh, and uh, what, what, what they report is they report how many people were named uh, Josh or Dennis or Celeste in North Dakota born in 1923. That's a count of people by name in a state. Uh, and I think they separate boys' names and girls' names. But, uh, so we don't know who the parents were, uh, all we know is they were born in that state uh, in that year. And then they, I think in the data, they report everything, every name that appears more than five times. Okay. So uh, let's do what uh, we're gonna do with a very understandable example. So first of all, it's not obvious to me, at least I had to think about it, like how could you use these names? Uh, how do I know which names indicate red states and blue states? Uh, how do I know which states are, you know, well, how am I going to do this? So I knew one tool. So I, I have a hammer, so that's what I'm going to apply to this. And it's, and it's, it, 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 it's Leo Goodman's row column model. Okay, so before I show you the model, I'll show you the output from uh, the model. Here's the kind of raw data that we'll have. We'll have 50 states, I believe, and we'll have um, lots of names. In fact, one could have thousands and thousands of names for, I think, good reason, we're going to limit ourselves to the top, I think, believe it's 25 names, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But for this example, let's pretend this is, this is I think, real data. This is real data. I'm not sure what, oh, it's from 2016. And I just took three names. I don't know why I took these names, and I took three states. I don't know why I took these states, but I did. Okay. And so here we have a cross-classification. The number of boys named Jeremy, born in Alabama in 2016 was 38. Named John was 324, named Wyatt was 136. Okay, so it's a cross classification, uh, a cross tab. Um, and we want to somehow, these are all qualitative categories, states and names, but we somehow want to assign quantitative scores to them. And that was, uh, uh, that's what Leo Goodman's model does, it tells you, how much the rows are associated with the columns. The rows can be anything, the columns can be anything. They can be colors, they can be flavors, they can be brands of soap. Um, and, the, uh, and these could be uh, ordered categories. They could be fair, poor, I'm, going, I'm not doing them in order, <laughs> poor, fair, good, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. um, 
I, when I took this course with, 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 with Theo, there was a student who did, uh, who looked at grades and determined, used this kind of model to figure out how different is an A from a B? How different is a B from a C? Kind of thing. Uh, and then the model will, will tell you what the order, if you, whether the order is what you think it is, and they could, or they could be unordered and, and impose an order on them. And then they tell you how far apart the rows and the columns are. Okay, so let's look at the scores that were out. It says that there's an intrinsic association between name and state of 0.3. I won't go into what that is. In fact, I think a challenge using these models is how to compare the intrinsic association across tables with different categories. So that's actually a topic that's been studied. Uh, okay, it says that Alabama is 0.3, Idaho is 3.3, and New York is minus 0.5. Okay, so they're, they're out of order. Idaho is far to one extreme and Alabama and New York are rather alike, uh, but the order is Idaho, Alabama, New York. So the table's out of order. Uh, in names, I actually got the order, the same order that is correct, uh, according to the model, uh, Jeremy, John, Wyatt. Okay, so what should you take seriously about these scores and what shouldn't you take seriously? Uh, you shouldn't take the sign seriously because we could just multiply them all by minus one if we wanted. Both by all the row scores by minus one and all the column scores by minus one, and it would give you the same uh, predictions. Uh, so negative and positive don't mean anything, they're just arbitrary. Uh, what you can take seriously is the order that Jeremy is closer to John than, than it is to Wyatt, and that Wyatt is closer to John than it is to Jeremy. Uh, uh, so the order and, and the distance that Wyatt is only half as far from John as Jeremy is from John. That's what the output is, 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 is telling us. Okay, this, this, is this what we would get from the table by just looking at something very simple, like the percentage of people who are Wyatt? Uh, I don't think so. I think this might, you might get something like this if you compare the ratio of Jeremy's to Wyatt's. You might get something that makes Idaho look like a big outlier uh, and you might get something roughly like that. But what it's doing is it's taking the distribution, it's asking how different, how similar are these distributions? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this. Yes. Does, Dennis, does zero mean anything? Or can you add anything to these? So there, uh, again, everything you could you could multiply something by three and minus and multiply the other one by one third to get the same thing. And I think you could probably add and subtract. So so there's there's kind of identifying constraints that are just arbitrary. Okay. So zero, I guess. I, I, I don't know what the identifying constraints for this program are, okay. but they do things like uh, make them all add up to one or okay. make the squares of them add up to something or okay. something. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. When I took uh, Leo Goodman's class, that was like what we were so confused about. Like, what are these constraints? Like, if they're just arbitrary, you know, you would just be told, oh, don't worry, it's just arbitrary. Uh, and we couldn't understand that it didn't matter. How could it be arbitrary? These are the numbers. Yeah. Okay. And for the intrinsic association, can you give an example of, you know, if, if there were a really high association, what would that mean in the table? Would it mean that all of the names were in one of the cells or? I think it would mean that the odds ratio of two by two tables in the order table would be very high on average. That's a rough okay. way of saying it. So very lots high, of- Very high clustering. Lots of diagonal, you know, once, for example. Yeah, that would okay. be an example of okay. a very high association, yeah. Uh, I think another way to say this is when you, when you, if you, if you were to, to, to put the masses in the, if you make a grid with everything spaced apart by horizontal and, and vertical, and you put the masses on those, once you kind of took out the marginals, it would be kind of bivariate normal and 0.3 would be like the correlation coefficient. Again, I'm speaking very loosely uh -huh. here. Okay. Yeah. If the data was all produced by a monkey, then it would zero. be a zero. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And all of these would just be basically the same number. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and here we have an example of why it sounds like Wyatt Earp to me at least. And so it doesn't surprise me that, 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 that maybe certain groups of the country would wanna give their, is Wyatt Earp a sheriff or an outlaw? I think he's a sheriff. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Anyway, it sounds like a kind of a Western rural name and Jeremy, what does that sound like? Immigrant name. Sorry? Immigrant name. Immigrant. Oh, I would have said like um, uh, the places where they have very expensive almond croissants. 
Uh, <laughs> and people have expensive baby carriages or something. I don't know. <laughs> but those could be, yeah. But, but, but probably there's, there's, a, there's a, the immigrant component is going to be a problem here. For example, Jose is a popular name in the United States, and we don't want the results just to reflect how many um, Hispanic origin immigrants are there in a place, because it would be no surprise that maybe Hispanic origin immigrants were attracted to places that were part of our electoral pattern, that had a particular electoral pattern. So that's why we're just gonna look at the top 25 names, which has pros and cons, but it means that the top 25 names, not per state, the top 25 national names, and those are the only table we're gonna consider. So uh, it's a plus in that we're gonna get the majority, but it's a minus in that we're only getting the majority. And of course, electoral politics are determined by the majority, but there's plenty of role for, uh, for, for coalitions and all that kind of thing. Okay, so here's uh, Leo Goodman. Uh, you know, uh, impressive obituary. He died in the first year of COVID. Of COVID, he was in Berkeley uh, in a nursing home, uh, but he taught at Berkeley for many years. At the end of uh, at the end of his career, and I got to take a course from him. And I highly recommend uh, this uh, article in Statistical Science called "A Conversation with Leo Goodman" by one of his proteges, Mark uh, Beckman. It's just enormously fun. Talks about history, all the people he knew. In the New York Times obit, uh, it says that uh, when he was, I think, in England with his soon-to-be wife or already wife, uh, Sylvia Plath knew him and told his wife, grab this guy, he's a good one. So he's, he really had an incredible, incredible life, um, Sylvia Plath, the poet. Um, and I got to know him as a, uh, as a student. I took his class in this building uh, in one of these closed rooms. I might have been the third floor, but maybe the fourth floor. It was, it was my first time in, in, in what was then Barrow's Hall, no windows in the room. And he had an incredible teaching style. He brought in his two books, full of his collected papers. And his teaching style was, any questions? Because <laughs> you had to do the reading before you went to class. And then somebody would ask a question, then he would just explain from the beginning up to that question. And then when he stopped, when he was done, he would say, any more questions? And it was actually a very effective, very impressive uh, way, way, way to teach. So that was the first time I met him. The second time I, I, I met Leo, I went to the Jewish Film Festival, uh, which had a, an auditorium on the Berkeley campus in Wheeler Hall. And we went and saw this Austrian trilogy, black and white, kind of World War II, not exactly a Holocaust story, but a very traumatic story. It was six hours, two hours followed by a break, two hours followed by a break, two hours. Um, and uh, uh, we just kind of walked in the intermission. I didn't, didn't see him at the event. Until the intermission, we walked outside this glorious Berkeley day. We'd just been watching this depressing, depressing, scary, tense uh, uh, movie. And it was glorious sunshine outside. And there was my former my professor from the previous term. And we got to talking because we got to see each other at the next break too. And then uh, the third uh, memorable occasion I had uh, with, with, with the Ogumna is when I came a professor here, uh, his assistant then, he was he was getting close to being retired, but he, he had an assistant helping him, uh, uh, called me up and said, uh, you know, Professor Goodman would like to take you to lunch, to congratulate you on becoming a Berkeley professor. And so we got wonderful, had a wonderful lunch together. And he showed me his latest research, which was deeply mathematical research on uh, appellate courts and the way appellate courts are assigned kind of game theory type of thing with how many people should there be on a panel and very technical type of stuff. But I think his brother or cousin is an appellate judge or was an appellate judge. This is a, a great picture of him. It looks like what I remember him as. Okay, so his model is, is, is uh, the demographers here will say, this looks kind of like the Lee Carter model or this looks kind of like John Wilmot's dissertation. Uh, uh, this is the count of people in the ith row and the jth column. And then we'll sweep out the kind of aggregate effects, like that New York is a big state and that Rhode Island is a small state. So if I is the, is the state, uh, a, the AIs are just gonna sweep all of that out. And the BJs are gonna sweep, sweep out uh, if it's John, very common name, or uh, Jeremy, a slightly less common name. Uh, and then it's gonna ask after that's swept out, uh, what is the association between these two things? And these U scores are the row scores and the V scores are the column scores and the phi is the uh, association, okay? So I mean, again, we don't have to understand all of this, um, but uh, uh, maybe just, just to get a little bit of intuition for those people who follow this kind of thing, uh, the log odds in the table 
between any uh, two by two table that you can make in the in the in the bigger table are going to be uh, uh, determined by the space between the row scores or the column scores and this this, this association. So if uh, if the U's are the same, uh, then you'll have independence and it'll be zero. All right, the, the, the log odds will be zero, yeah. Uh, okay. And if they're very different, you'll get big numbers. So there'll be big odds ratios. Okay, so now it's your turn. Uh, what will the map of state scores look like? Uh, well, that's not so interesting because I already told you it's gonna look like the electoral map, but which names are gonna be associated with which region? So let's do boys, just, just use the room here. What's gonna be a red name? Total silence. Quiet. Okay, E too easy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but good, you answered. Paige, what's gonna be a red name? Okay, a boy, a common name. Okay, maybe a red name, okay. How about a blue name? It's hard, right? When you see these, you're gonna say, oh yeah, those are red names, those are blue, right? Newt, a red name, good. Okay, unfortunately, unfortunately, or Liam, which is Liam? Blue name, good, okay, I'm liking this. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I hope people have kind of a little bit of, uh, of, of, of a feeling for this. Okay, let's look at what it actually ends up being. Uh, so this is, I'm not showing you the, uh, the state scores. I've done, drawn a map of the state scores. Kind of which states are close to each other, which states are far away from each other on this. But let's skip the map for now and let's look at the names. So Jackson, William, James, Mason, Elijah, Samuel, Logan, Liam are all orange names, red. And Anthony, Matthew, oh, so, so, oh, but you said it was gonna be a red name. It's actually a very blue name, Daniel, Jaden. So when I hear Jaden, I think of an African-American name. So there's probably, uh, there, there may be, you know, there, there's even looking at the top 25 names, the population composition may play a little bit of effect. David, Alexander. So these are what we call the, you know, the blue names and these are the, are, are the red names. And you're ignoring alternate spelling. So you're just taking the most common spelling. These the are, name. yeah, there's, we can look at the, the, the documentation and the social security, how they do it, but yes, exactly. Joshua spelled uh, J-O-H-S-U-A. Uh, I don't know if they correct or not, or whether they call that a separate name. Yeah, these are the top twenty-five names, and 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 I guess and Joshua is a very neutral name. Aiden and Noah, these are kind of popular everywhere. I guess is what it says at this time. Okay, so uh, the then if we look at the state scores, so what happens is sorry, I should maybe just show you in this example here. What happens is the negative scores go with the negative scores, and the positive scores go with the positive scores. Is how to think that Alabama goes with Wyatt and New York goes with Jeremy. That's the way this works. So, uh, so in the same way, Anthony, Matthew, Daniel go with the purple. In this case, it's the negative, and uh, Jackson, William, James, Mason, Elijah go with the orange. In this case, okay. And this is broadly it looks like the bipostal pattern we might expect, um, but there are exceptions. You know, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma are not what we would think of as uh, blue states and uh, you know Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire are are more like the the you know the kind of the empty quarter of the United States in terms of naming than they are like uh, Massachusetts and New York. Okay. Now this is also I'm just drawing an arbitrary line between two colors. <laughs> so if we did it more graded, we would and we could do a scatter plot of of these and kind of see how spread are spread out they are. And, and that's what uh, Maria has done some of. Okay, other questions about how we score names? Yes. One question is, so this, these top 25 names, which are chosen, like that universe of names comes from the whole country. Yeah. So certain states would be overrepresented and different states may have different variability in like how much coverage, you know, what fraction of boys yeah. have names within that top 25. Yes. Does that impact this at all? Well, it's kind of like we're doing the Wyatt to Jeremy ratio in all places, regardless of whether Wyatt and Jeremy are very important for that place, but it's much more complicated. It's taking all 25 names in a complicated way. Uh, so I don't, I don't, uh, I, I guess I can answer you empirically, which is that when we do this slightly different ways and do 50 names or 10 names, it doesn't really change the story much, but 
I hadn't thought deeply about this, so I don't know whether uh, kind of I'm, I'm kind of thought of the worst case scenario where you could get this association even though you know, something else is going on. Uh, yes, there's no urban rural information, right? Like that. There's no urban rural information. It's just total state. Yeah, and, and Rhode Island is the same as Texas in this. Yeah. Okay. Although there is, I mean, the the method there is some statistical significance, and the fitting is kind of a little bit. So it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna discount randomness a little bit in assigning the the, the, the fact that, that Rhode Island doesn't quite line up the way it should, it's going to kind of hmm. take into account the samples are small. And so it's not going to give a lot of weight to the fact that there's twice as many Jeremy's as Wyatt and what as Wyatt's in Rhode Island. It's kind of say, well, there's going to be some sampling error. Yeah. At least contemporaneously, you can get the birth certificate data that would give you the name and you would get the place. So you would get county. Uh -oh. yeah. Yes. So we can yeah. talk about ways to do this better at the end and i'll have some slides and i don't actually know how to get this stuff easily so if people have i was i it's theoretically possible but i don't know how to get it easily so yeah okay let's look at a uh, 100 years ago uh so this is 1910 to 1919 the first decade where the data is available oh and good i do have the names okay well first of all the pattern is totally different the pattern is north south with like you know is this the mason dixon line uh delaware the yeah. Pennsylvania border, southern border is the nation. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the states that are kind of Missouri comparable. I mean, it's like incredible the north south line that was that was that was there. Okay, it's only 40 years after the Civil War, 50 years after the Civil, Civil War. The west, where we are now, was part of the south. Alaska and Hawaii uh, were too. Um, okay. And the names were, well, with Jackson, Jack. Let's see, two, two, yeah. So, so orange, orange is corresponding to 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 the positive night names, and and Donald, Harold, Raymond, Joseph, Edward were the Jeremys and Matthews of their of their day. And then uh, fifty years ago, it's a different pattern. Uh, again, the names are are different, um, uh, but you see this, you know, kind of. It's not a north south pattern anymore. It's not an east coast west coast pattern. It's a different pattern. It's the electoral pattern. I'll give you a little heads up. It is the electoral pattern. Okay. So now let's look at the elections. Okay. Uh, here we are. Uh, the modern. The here's here's our here's our name score map, and here are the election maps. Now they're not identical. Uh, for one thing, these election maps are actually who won in that state. It's not who, it's not kind of the 50th percentile above or below. So because these were, were they fairly close elections? Yes. 2016 was very close. 2012 yeah. also? Two or three percent. Yeah. Uh, but if, in terms of number of states, it's not super close. So there's, you know, so there's even if even if the model were working perfectly and names were perfectly correlated with with uh, even if my thinking model is is working perfectly. This is kind of the wrong index because we'd want to we'd want to do like above the median or below the median in terms of Republican votes as opposed to the actual winner. Uh, if, if we looked at Reagan or better Nixon 1972, the map would look just all red, <laughs> but it could well be that it was very associated with names how much Nixon won by. But this doesn't have that problem. Okay, and so you know we. Uh, we see more or less the same pattern. Now you can argue it's not exactly the same pattern, but it's more or less the same pattern where the coast and the central east coast, mid-Atlantic are the strongholds of the Democrats and they also have the same name pattern. The middle of the country by and large and the south has a, a, a different electoral outcome and a different name pattern. Now, the southern states are not, you know, obviously, because it's not 100% consistent. But no. Okay, so uh, a stop clock tells time accurately once a day. It could be that this is the name pattern or the electoral pattern all the time. But no, we just saw the electoral, the name pattern changes over time. And so if the electoral, if the electoral pattern changes the same as the name pattern, that's much stronger evidence. So if we go 100 years ago to, uh, Taft and, and William Jones Bryan, 
we see, in fact, that the electoral map was a north-south map, the same as uh, the, uh, the name map, with the exception of you know, California here. Uh, but you also see the spattering of the south here, just like you, you do here. And I guess Hawaii and Alaska aren't states, I so, I, so I don't know how, how we could measure their electoral outcome back then. But uh, okay, so uh, how about uh, 1960 when we saw that strange pattern? Well, 1960, who was running? Kennedy and his running partner, his running mate, Kennedy from Massachusetts, Johnson, Johnson from Texas. Texas. That's right. So an incredible alliance. I don't know enough about the history of that election. I should know, but um, but. Um, uh, I'm sure it was strategically done. You know, uh, Kennedy did not choose his running mate in order to lose, uh, and 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 in fact, they were able the they were able to get New England and parts of the South, and you know, you can say they they did that because of he chose Johnson, or you could say, well, no, there was some kind of alliance there, there was some kind of common way of thinking between. At, at this moment in time in 1960 between the South and uh, New England. And indeed, that's what, in terms of the culture of names, that's what seems to have been the case. Okay. Claude is, is appropriately shaking his head. This is not this, super strong evidence, but yeah. This was, the era, this was the era in which segregationist white conservatives voted democratic, which we no longer, we can no longer imagine that, but that was, most of the 20th century, you had, an, you had a party which had really two different parts to it. One part was Southern whites, conservative Southern yes. whites. And the other part were Northern immigrant working class. So isn't it weird that they give their children the same names? Yeah. And, uh, but, but that's a political science answer to why you get the state of New York and the state of Alabama. You're talking the about the electoral map. Yeah, the electoral Absolutely. Map. Yes. There's a very interesting history you know, explanation for this electoral map. Why does that line up with culture? Apparently, apparently it did. If you were to believe, if you're to believe the results of, I'll call it Leo Goodman's results, but they're, they're my results <laughs> using his model. Isn't New England a different color from the South? Sorry? Isn't New England a different color from the South? It's name? Am I reading this wrong? Uh, okay. So I, maybe I said New England too quickly. Uh, it's it's kind of the, the the northeast. That's right. And Massachusetts is not the same color as Texas in names, whereas in the election, very much the same. Actually, I don't know how close Texas was. I don't know how Republican, how conservative, I should say, Texas was even. But um, obviously, the issues of the day were you know race, segregation, completely different set of of issues than than today. Uh, so I, I think this is probably the most interesting to look in. It would be it kind of inspires other kind of, you might want to look a little more carefully at the name analysis to see it's really correct, but then wait, are there other things going on that are culturally uh, creating this kind of axis, the, the Kennedy Johnson axis. Okay, so uh, I'm basically done. The, we have these realignments, North, South, early 20th century, Kennedy's coalition, uh, uh, you know, this is this is pre civil rights and, and pre the Southern strategy of Republicans. So, like Claude was just saying, and we have today's maps. Uh, you know, you go to Idaho and there are Confederate flags. You go to uh, what's it called, the state of Jefferson, Northern California, Southern Oregon, and there are Confederate flags. What's going on there? Well, part of the story is that the people there are, to some extent, the descendants of people who fled the South and wanted to found these white utopias in Oregon and Idaho. So there's a little bit of history of this, but it's also kind of the modern, you know, it's, it's a modern phenomenon. Um, uh, if you look at the people who, who are being tried for uh, insurrection and other crimes from the Capitol attack, there's, you know, pretty interesting cross-section of, of people from different backgrounds that all have the kind of the same ideology. Uh, uh, so just some, some caveats here. Uh, the voters are not the same people giving names to their children. The people giving names to children actually probably have pretty low voting rates 
for very for those people don't go to the polls, but they're also they're young. Uh, uh, so it is kind of remarkable that this works because the electorate is by and large, I guess, the grandparents <laughs> or, or or the parents of the people giving the names. Uh, but I guess that just says something that even though we think this is an individual act of choice when we give our children names, it's really a reflection of the community and society we live in. And so somehow this, this is working. The parents are acting as a proxy uh, for this. Uh, you know, we're looking at the top names. I said this is a good thing because we're, if we want to make the link to politics, it's the majority that wins, but it's also not taking into account all the diversity of society. And it's obviously a, a, a con. Uh, and then, you know, the geography is by state. Uh, there's no within state. And, but presumably we would see this in California. We would see different, I mean, California is going to be very dominated by uh, immigrant fertility or the children, second, third generation. So there's going to be a lot of patterns like that. But presumably within any state, you would see this divide in names if you could look within the state. That's, that's the hypothesis. Uh, so what could we do? Uh, it would be very interesting to follow Will's idea to get birth certificate data by place and race. I don't know how, like, we can get it for California, but we can't get it for all the states at once, can we? Oh, uh, NCHS would give you that with yeah. the names. I know I've been able to get it from California. Yeah, California, um, we, we yeah. could do. They might not consider is, this serious science. And, and, and you know that whether the parents are born in the US or not. So you could get at some of the immigration right. issues too. Yeah. But yeah, I, we'd have to see what you can get for NCHS national. Okay, you could do more than just look at pictures and you could actually ask, is this apparent picture, this map, this parent correlation in the map, is it, you could do all kinds of statistical analysis and ask, are the names really predictive? Of, so then, then we wouldn't want to map name scores as orange or purple. You would want to actually use the score and take into account all kinds of things. So that's some work. Uh, does the strength of association change over time? I'm not sure if this is easy or not. Marie and I, I, I think it's maybe, Easy. I think we just want to kind of look at the correlation between the name scores and the um, electoral outcomes over time and ask, does that get stronger or weaker or is it relatively constant? Um, is it the names themselves or are there leaders and followers? And is that really what's going on here? I don't quite know how to do that, but one could think about that. And, and of course, people who study names do this kind of thing all the time. And then you could probably do this with microdata. There are states like Florida and Ohio where the, where the voter rolls are public. So you can see who voted in the Republican primaries, who voted in the Democratic primaries by their name. And if you had the birth certificate data, you could link them to the birth certificate. So you can actually see at a micro level if you didn't like this ecological uh, analysis. Okay, so that's, that's it. Uh, the conclusions are that baby names seem to track the political divide, that identity voting is not new, it has a long history. And the bad news, I mean, identity voting is not really good news for our country, right? That identity voting is how things have always worked and still working. It, it's it's, it's going to be hard to change minds if this is what's driving uh, elections. So that's, I think that's already been said, but this is just kind of reinforcing this. But it's always been the case, maybe. And so uh, there's no, it's not a new challenge that our country faces. It's, it's, it's the, same, the same challenge. Okay. Uh, oh, what about baby girls? Here are your names. Lillian, Harper, Addison, Ella are the orange names. And Sophia, Victoria, Mia, Emily, Isabella are the, are, are the purple names. So actually these are fairly, now that I look at these names, I'm not saying why I say they didn't connote things. Maybe when I looked at the old ones, I couldn't do it, but, but, but Lillian and Harper sound, you know, they connote Southern Magnolias to me. And Sophia, uh, Victoria, uh, Isabella uh, connote strollers uh, in front of very expensive stores to me. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, boys and girls together, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Thank you. Our tradition here, our new tradition is to end at 110. So we don't have to stay till 110, but we, uh, we, we, uh, we now have. 12 minutes or something for questions. I'm going to be mad. Oh, can, we, can we show the screen? Uh, oh, we can't show everybody, can we? Okay. Yeah, we've had questions from the we've had questions from the room. So let's take Ethan first. Ethan, share again. Okay, sure. Thanks. 
Um, I really like those research direction slides. This is uh, interesting. And, and all the time, I'm, I'm kind of curious about the question of uh, cohesion within the groups. Um, kind of the, and I saw that a lot on the, the last slide with the girls' names, the clustering or kind of the, the distribution was very different. Um, I'm just wondering if one of these networks is, you know, if there's, if there's another element here that's not captured, which is how much is naming originality or non-conformity valued by the different camps. I'm kind of curious how that would impact the analysis. I mean, I could see situations in which, yeah, I mean, naming heterogeneity within a group could be increasing, which is actually a sign that group cohesion is increasing too. Just any thoughts yeah. on that? So I think maybe that's a nice answer to the question that was raised by Maddie. This method is not going to do that because we're only taking mm -hmm. the top 25 names. And so it's not, it's not looking at what proportion of the names are in those 25. It's just pretend those other people don't even exist. Um, so that would be uh, a way, you know, what you, uh, so you could ask something like, uh, is, the, uh, is the variation in names, the, dis the variance of the distribution of names, is it, is it related to, to this? Yes. And it would give you something, it would be using different information than I'm using. It might give you the same thing. I don't know. What would be your hypothesis, Stephen? Who's going to be more conformist? All the Berkeley iconoclasts wearing Birkenstocks and tie dye and I, actually, my, my prior would be that it's uh, it's about the same. That that I think you know that just the, the dimensions of nonconformity are different. You know, we have uh, uh, you know maybe some some people. I, I think the, the, the tendency to want to tweak a, a letter in a name or change and get a unique spelling. Um, maybe it's shared on on both both political extremes. Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, in the room, Dennis. Um, really interesting and thought provoking. Thank you. Um, I, I was so I don't understand the method exactly, but it looks like kind of like a matrix decomposition approach, which would mean that you could take more than one dimension. So can you do that? Can you look yes. at like what? So why did you pick one? I mean, you might get a better description if you had say three or four dimensions that you were breaking this into. You could reconstruct better. Usually it, there may be some criterion for picking or just curious. So okay, so, uh, so you could definitely uh, do this in multiple dimensions. Uh, I didn't. I think the reason I didn't is because I think this is already way more complicated than the people <laughs> who are interested in this can understand. So why not? I mean, it, adding complexity was not appealing to me. Uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to actually, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm doing even more than in these maps, I'm doing even more than one dimension. I'm doing a binary kind of dimension where I do the map. The model isn't doing that, but mm -hmm, so I'm mm -hmm. already throwing away all that information in show, showing you here. Um, so, but it's just like you're saying, this is like principal components. Right, so you're going to get orthogonal right. components. And so if you wanted to do prediction, you could ask, uh, you know, how much does, like the fact that Texas you know, it could be that, that these Southern states, while they are similar in the first component to the, by the coastal states, in the second component, they're right. very different and you right. can see that. Now, none of these things are, not, are telling you why it is. We make up stories after the fact, but uh, yes, yes, you could do that. And, and, and Leo Goodman has a very nice paper mm -hmm. on how to draw graphical displays, both in one dimension and in two and how not to. And he, he kind of had, had a long running debate with the French um, principal components people who he, he, he argued were kind of seeing story, you know, seeing constellations in the sky. They were seeing patterns where there was none and, and, his, and, and his displays were kind of meant to, to avoid that false, that false inference. Yeah. Uh, Claude? Yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, so I, I did, I've been, I've been looking at a lot of literature on cultural uh, polarization. And so this is really very, very interesting. I'll send you some references if you're interested in them. It seems to me that part of the task here is to isolate the naming as a cultural decision, as a decision by the parents. Mm -hmm. And more, uh, it's related to these sort of, uh, related to these sort of political issues or cultural issues, the extent to which you can sort of subtract out uh, cultural, like Hispanic versus uh, Anglo, Black, and so forth. And another factor along those lines, especially as you go back historically, would be migration patterns. That is, the people who settle 
the upper Midwest, it's not just that they are Scandinavian disproportionately, but they're also disproportionately uh, New England. Uh, so there's an interconnection among the states, the locations. And anyway, it, it, in terms of you know, future research, the extent to which that could be, um, if you could sort of partial out and what you're left with is this sort of pure expression of taste, I think that, that would be, that would strengthen the argument. So uh, that, I mean, that kind of goes to motivation for getting more yeah. data and doing what Will was talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the rural urban thing, that a lot of this literature that I'm looking at uh, suggests that, that, that a lot of what we're seeing is state differences, is partly state differences in the political realm, but it's also this huge rural urban differences, rural urban differences. I mean, for those of us who used to be urban sociologists, it is just gobsmacking. That these are differences that were supposed to go away, and instead they've become more and more accentuated. Yeah. And and if the naming pattern is reflective of these other cultural patterns, it, it would show, for instance, inland California versus coastal California. Yeah. Which would give you a huge. Differences. Yeah. And if one had the micro data, one could, could could ask: Are inland whites different from coastal whites? Are inland Hispanics different from coastal Hispanics? And you might expect to see, I mean, also the voting data, you probably need to look at too to see how much those differ, but, uh, but there's probably a lot a lot there, yeah. yeah. Polarization stuff seems to be among whites. So the extent to which you could look at whites alone, probably sharpen. So I didn't quite understand your first point about to what extent is this an individual decision? And the alternative was what? Well, that there's sort of uh, family traditions, uh, uh, cultural constraints. Uh, so you might be a third generation Hispanic family that's culturally assimilated in many ways, but you have a grandfather named Jose or Manuel yeah. and so forth. So the extent to which that could be taken into account. Yeah. Great, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I so I think that you can see arguments for both directions that there's a it's plausible that you know culture is sort of driving political changes, but you also have some really interesting shocks because like you're referring to the civil rights uh, that bill so you know from 1960 to the elections just after Johnson signs the civil rights bills where we see this big you know, electoral shift. And do you see the name shift really quickly in the years after he signs this? I mean, because that would you know, give you some sense of what's the, 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 it, the immediate shock going in the other direction where politics can drive those names. I think that'd be interesting to see how big that direction is. Yeah, and I don't know what actually happened in terms of whether people change sides, individuals change sides, or whether they just kept their same, they had their view before and after. Uh, but you could imagine that suddenly uh, a national publication, Newsweek or something, I don't know what the Life Magazine readership changed dramatically, kind of pre and post uh, uh, civil rights movement and that sort of thing. So yeah, we have the annual data. Uh, the, I group these things together by 10 years, partly because I don't want to get into the causality of what's before and what's after, but also because if I'm doing all 50 states, the kind of you have the Rhode Island, Vermont, Utah kind of issues. But um, but one could look at the big states, you know, in, in the south and north and actually, and actually see see what 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 happens. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Can interesting you, suggestion. Yes, please. Ken has a question. Oh, Ken. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to raise the issue of uh, how names get into the top 25, because yeah. it seems to me that names that are distinctively regional and don't have broad overall coverage are not easily going to get into the top 25. So the most characteristic names, the names where you'd get the biggest gradients, probably aren't in this list. And if the names are dominated by total national national totals, then California, New York, Pennsylvania, Florida are going to have an outsized influence on what names get into this list also. So could you speak to a, a little to that? I'm most struck in the girls' names that all the common biblical names except Elizabeth seem to be largely missing from the list. There are no and Sarah's, Susan's, uh, so Mary's. So there's something unusual about the, the list of top 25, is there not? Uh, well, yes and no. 
uh, in terms of what fraction of the names the top 25 covered, covers a very large fraction. I don't know what it is right now, but it's not it's not 25%, uh, it's 60% or I'm making this up a uh, check, but it, it's that names kind of follow this kind of power or law so that there's lots and lots of interesting names, but very few people have them and a very large fraction have have, um, have, 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 have the top names. Um, but yeah, I think Ken, you're right in that a name that was given just in Louisiana would not be given elsewhere. And so it would be it, the, the kind of names that we're picking up on are names that are contagious from Louisiana to Idaho. So you have to be kind of common enough that it carries, it, it, it kind of carries out of the local context and has some power over, you know, uh, but but I think the, the the Wyatt Jeremy ratio is kind of the way to think about this. Uh, it's 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 some complicated function of the relative frequencies of these common of, of these names. So we're just kind of we're seeing a truncated distribution. We're seeing all the names, but we're getting we should be getting the right story because we're looking we're doing something fancier than Wyatt Jeremy, but we're not including. Oh, I wish I knew a nice. Louisiana name, uh, you know, it's not there. And we also don't have um, uh, the, uh, the kid's name Stonewall, uh, Stonewall Jackson type of thing. So, because uh, that's just not a common enough name. So, uh, to, to me, I guess the re main reason I focus on the 25 is because if you go a lot more, it's it's really you're getting a map of what is of the modern map. It's just how many people of Hispanic origin do you have in your state. Uh, so that's what I was trying to get away from. And with the girls' names, you could easily believe a lot of these are Hispan uh, Hispanically influenced. The boys, it's a little less the case. Let's see. That might be a reason to add dimensions to your composition. Yeah. You can soak that up in one dimension, and then here are the boys. And Ken, interestingly, the biblical influence on the boys in the same time period is unbelievable, right? I mean, look at the middle of the distribution. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's the fact that boys and girls names go in such different direction. I think this is, uh, we'd, we'd have to read uh, Lieberson's book again to kind of see how, how, how long standing things. But the fact that they move kind of in different trends, different times, suggests that it is this, this kind of arbitrary process, that it's not the characteristic of the name, it's just ha has to do with the fashion cycle. And why would, uh, I mean, I guess you could say that the biblical, that, the, that these are old fashioned names and maybe the girls, let's see. You know, are these names old fashioned? I don't know what, I don't, Evelyn and Lily would be, yeah, so it's, it's very, it's very complicated. I think the point is, is a good one, and 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 many of the comments have gotten to, to pieces of this. Uh, and and Ethan's comment about uh, unusualness being itself a characteristic is is is, 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 is I think I think there are probably other dimensions like that that Ken is is pointing to. And certainly, an idiosyncratic name uh, is not going to be operating here. I mean, the great mystery, the reason sociologists love names is because everybody thinks they're choosing, but somehow everybody makes the same choice at the same time. And it's just very bizarre. If you, it, it, it's, it's like this, um, uh, you know, Bourdieu was fascinated by this. I don't know if, I don't know what the history of this is, how far it goes back into the 19th century. And the French are really still into this. There's, there's people who are professors of the sociology of names. <laughs> okay, let's stop here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for a nice kickoff, and we'll see you uh, next week for another wonderful in-house speaker, our own Maddie Duhon.